Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce, uh, to welcome you to Grand Rounds this morning and introduce uh, Dr. Mark Reisman. This is a somewhat bittersweet introduction, as I'll explain in a second. Um, when I came to the University of Washington, it's almost been 10 years ago, um, there was this guy from Swedish who was a volunteer faculty member but was coming over to the university to be the co-investigator on a little trial called Partners that was investigating this new technology nobody thought would uh, really work called Tavern. Um, it took about three years of cajoling and negotiating, um, but we convinced Mark to come over um, to on faculty um, in 2014 and head up our interventional cardiology program. I will say um, it has been one of the sections that has really been transformed over the last six or seven years. Uh, I think almost everyone is um, new in the section and clearly it has risen um, nationally in terms of reputation. It's grown in size and we will be forever thankful for to Mark for his role in that. While he's been here, he has been an incredible force building um, the academic side of the interventional um, uh, section. Um, through a lot of his efforts, we were able to set up the David and Nancy Off Chair uh, in Cardiovascular Inno Innovation, set up the Center for Cardiovascular Innovation, which has really been a catalyst for um, education and um, um, promoting the University of Washington really around uh, the world. He himself um, has been incredibly uh, productive since he's uh, been here. He has authored over 100 uh, manuscripts, has, uh, I think, 12 or 13 book chapters, but has been a real role model and mentor to the other members in the um, uh, section. Um, so this morning, I am sorry to say that this may be his um, uh, last official Grand Rounds as a faculty member here. Mark has been recruited uh, to Cornell uh, Columbia in uh, New York. Um, on one hand, we I will um, be very sad to see him go. But on the other hand, I'm very thankful for everything that he has done and given to the university and wish him the best of luck and hope that he will come back and visit often. So with that, I turn it over to Mark, who's going to give grand rounds this morning, uh, entitled Transcatheter Tricuspid Valve Therapy. Thanks, Mark. You bet. Thank you, Rob. I uh, appreciate the opportunity, and thank you for the very uh, nice introduction. Uh, obviously, uh, somewhat bittersweet, as, as many of you know, I, I love very much the University of Washington, uh, but just moving on to uh, a new challenge and, and being closer to family. So uh, again, thank you, Rob, uh, for the introduction. Okay, what I'd like to um, spend the next uh, 40 minutes or so is uh, describing and discussing transcatheter tricuspid uh, valve therapy. Uh, with regard to this, I have uh, nothing to disclose. So just tricuspid regurgitation, that's gonna really be, be our focus. And um, if anybody's been following the literature for the last almost decade, um, there's an enormous amount of literature called calling the tricuspid valve uh, the forgotten valve. And just a quick search on our UW library uh, came up with about 723 results for tricuspid valve, the forgotten valve, uh, where is the valve, redefining the valve, acknowledging the forgotten valve. Um, and there's, there's reasons for that. And, um, and part of the reason is that uh, we've really struggled over at least my career and, and even before to some extent on who to treat, when to treat, uh, what is the method of treatment. Um, is it, if it is medical, um, we should consider that. Or is it surgical, percutaneous? And if it is percutaneous, which is essentially the focus of this talk, uh, what technology should we use? So with that, um, just to start, this is um, some early leaders in our field, uh, Nina Brunwald, John Ross, who is my mentor at UC San Diego, and I think many of you know Andrew Morrow. Uh, in 67, uh, they wrote that um, the president's results of this paper uh, indicate that uh, tricuspid regurg will improve or disappear after mitral replacement. 
and that tricuspid valve uh, replacement is seldom necessary. Um, so this is uh, the early thinking, um, and it really sounded somewhat logical, but over time, uh, with more information being gained, I think we've, uh, we understand it a little bit more. So it's always good to show a, a case, and this is, um, this is a patient who, um, who I'm taking care of right now when I was seen in clinic, who I think by any definition would uh, agree this is a really, well, I wouldn't even call this severe. There's a term that I'll describe later, but torrential uh, tricuspid regurgitation. Um, and she's asymptomatic, completely asymptomatic. And it's only recently uh, that she started uh, diuretic therapy, but really had no symptoms, very active uh, patient. And um, I was seeing her actually in follow-up because several years ago, uh, she had mitral valve repair, and you can see the rings of the repair um, on, the, um, on the left side of the heart here. So let's start with a couple of cases, and, um, and then we'll come back to them at the end of the talk. This is a patient uh, who's in his 80s, who I saw for severe, whoop, I saw for a severe uh, MR. Uh, we did a mitral clip. This is the result uh, post-mitral clip. Here's a nice 3D on fuss of the mitral clip in place. And then, this, and then with that, um, as you all know, we do a transeptal puncture uh, when doing the mitral clip procedure. And you can see here, there's clearly a right uh, to left shunt. <clears throat> and this is secondary to severe uh, TR, which was basically um, uh, generated predominantly from, uh, from a pacemaker that the lead was in place and probably somewhat attributed to his left-sided uh, failure. So that's one patient that um, we're going to think about as I pr proceed through the talk, and then ultimately uh, I will describe some of the things that we did. This is another patient who has severe TR, multiple emissions for hepatic encephalopathy. Some of our colleagues here have taken care of this person for a very long time. When we met him, he was hospitalized. He was somnolent and difficult to, to arouse, and um, this is what his TR looked like. Uh, you can see here quite severe as well. And then on this is uh, the short axis, so the transgastric. Uh, and you can see very poor coaptation of his, uh, of his leaflets on the tricuspid side. So as you can see, maybe not even as severe as TR as that initial patient I showed you, but uh, clearly um, enough to uh, create some really very uh, incredibly challenging uh, clinical issues. And then the final patient I'll share um, is a patient whose status post mitral valve repair. He was at our, one of our um, hospitals in Seattle for 120 days, um, and uh, he was referred from this outside hospital for care. He got a beautiful result on his, um, on his mitral valve, as you can see here, but wound up with very severe uh, TR, and that was due to um, during the Swan-Gans catheter uh, position and placement, there were multiple complications and wound up with what you can see here is a flail uh, septal leaflet. So three very separate etiologies uh, for tricuspid regurgitation uh, by, described by these three patients. And this patient, is a, 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 he's in his 80s now, but a former Blue Angel, Angel Squadron leader um, and really debilitated and, and uh, from being in uh, the hospital for so long, he's got <clears throat> a horrible decubitus uh, ulcer. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's uh, look at the current treatments that are now available and the recommendations. Um, this is, these are the guidelines from 2014. Here's the European guidelines from about 2012. And um, as many of you know, and many of you worked on, uh, there are several updates to the guidelines. Uh, but in terms of TR, they have not been updated at all. And interestingly enough, if you look at the guidelines, um, there were two pages actually um, uh, focused on tricuspid regurgitation. Um, I talked to uh, Dr. Otto, and, and she just uh, really just remarked about the, the limited amount of data uh, that's available in order to set very firm uh, guidelines. But the, and, and just as, a, as obviously, um, as I mentioned, most of the guideline recommendation are based on these small uh, retrospective uh, studies, as well as uh, expert consensus. Looking at the guidelines, uh, many of you uh, know them, uh, but basically the only um, level one uh, recommendation is severe TR undergoing a left-sided surgery. 
The rest are two A's or two B's. And most of these for functional or secondary uh, MR, as mentioned in the earlier slide, are really um, supported only by um, consensus uh, documents, uh, non-randomized data. And so clearly there's a very limited uh, amount of information supporting uh, what to do for these patients uh, with severe uh, TR. So in summary, you can see that really the only um, firm recommendation are those patients who have severe TR and undergoing left-sided uh, surgery. And then this is just a, a way to look at it easier uh, in terms of visually uh, knowing what to do with patients with the variety of stages of TR and how to uh, manage them. When looking at the stages of functional TR specifically, um, I'll focus on the symptomatic severe uh, TR. Uh, the functional is really based on um, really a sort of a sense of a, a gathering of uh, echo guided information uh, in terms of the annular dilatation, um, the jet, uh, the, the continuous wave jet, as well as uh, features of hemodynamics as well. And as you can see here, the, the symptoms can be very, very, um, very, very diffuse or limited in some way. Uh, because of the fact that these patients just don't present with overt symptoms. It could just be essentially uh, fatigue um, when, when uh, seeing these patients. And then you can see here, this is uh, Dreyfus, who did really the majority of the work around um, looking at uh, TR uh, in terms of when to operate. And his, it was his real seminal work early on that really defined uh, this uh, annular dilatation uh, greater than 40 uh, millimeters as sort of a signal uh, when you should operate on these patients if they have uh, left-sided uh, symptoms. And in fact, this paper um, if basically is the paper that uh, really drives a lot of the surgical volume in patients who are receiving, receiving a left-sided procedure. Maybe it's a cabbage or it's a mitral valve replacement. And basically, what his guidance is from this is that any, any patient with a uh, enlarged uh, tricuspid annulus uh, should be considered for surgery, that being greater than 40 millimeters, and that is irrespective uh, of the grade of tricuspid regurgitation. So this was uh, very interesting to me, obviously, that this was driven uh, specifically um, by a one-dimensional uh, measurement, 40 millimeters in a very complex three-dimensional structure. But more recent data that he's published in 2015 has even suggested that using the apical four-chamber view and measuring an apical four-chamber view and, and, and getting these values that exceed um, 40 millimeters should drive the decision when doing left-sided surgery to do a uh, annuloplasty. Looking more at some of the echo information, this is the work uh, done by Zamorano and, and Becky Hahn. Um, and what they've done is um, they've actually extended uh, the echo findings uh, with regard to, um, to, to the severity of tricuspid regurgitation. Specifically, it no longer is it just uh, severe um, as, as, the, as the worst uh, echo finding, but now we have what's called massive and, and torrential, as you can see here, and I'll let that play. And I think torrential really reflects maybe some of the uh, images that I showed uh, earlier uh, in, in my talk. So I think what, what was the driver for this, number one, was to provide greater clarity um, to uh, understanding the, the amount of, uh, or the quantification of uh, the tricuspid regurgitation. But I think what also was a driver for this, now that I've done a lot of these percutaneous procedures, was basically being able to um, be able to articulate to colleagues and to be able to describe what has occurred during a procedure. And as you'll see, there are several patients that are treated that go from torrential to severe that have improved. And um, we would not be able to actually be able to share that in a concise way if the highest level of, um, of our grading scale was severe because it would have gone from just severe to severe. So I think, uh, I wouldn't say the motivation was that, but certainly it's given cl clarity uh, for us with regard to um, a lot of our uh, therapies. And then how much reduction really does impact the patient in terms of quality of life and uh, mortality. 
Just quickly, uh, looking at medical therapy uh, for um, tricuspid regurgitation, <laughs> the uh, diuretics are a class uh, 2A recommendation. And any other um, treatments that uh, directly uh, impact the pulmonary circulation are a class uh, 2B with a level of evidence of C. So even on the medical side, uh, you don't get a tremendous amount of, um, of direction and clarity based on, on hard data, but obviously um, diuretics are, are truly the mainstay uh, therapy um, for this cohort of patients. And essentially when, when doing uh, patients um, in clinical trials for these percutaneous procedures, the guideline directed medical therapy that is got, that is standardized is diuretic therapy. And beyond that, um, there's really not much that we're offering uh, these patients. So looking now at some of the uh, work that's been done more recently, specifically uh, looking at annulopathy versus a conservative approach uh, in patients with TR undergoing <clears throat> a left-sided uh, heart procedure. There are several uh, studies that were performed, but it really took a meta-analysis to finally uh, drive some of the decision-making in terms of getting an overall a benefit, uh, and this benefit was seen at about five years. So this meta-analysis basically showed that a concomitant tricuspid valve repair strategy at the time of left-sided valve surgery is associated with a lower risk of cardiac mortality and improved echocardiographic TR outcomes at long-term follow-up. So this, uh, again, the work of Dreyfus and others now is really putting that, maybe embedding it more solid uh, in our uh, therapy um, strategy uh, as we take care of these patients. And then the question is, uh, should it be repair uh, versus replacement? Um, if you look at repair, um, this is three months post repair. This is Jose Navia's work. It's, uh, there was a residual uh, TR that was uh, either moderate or severe in 34% of the patients at three months. And then at five years, uh, you could see uh, 45%. And so this was important to know and that uh, basically just doing a repair and just doing the, um, the uh, annuloplasty uh, may not be sufficient, in fact. And, um, and this may speak to some of the other uh, nuances, such as the subvalvular apparatus. And I think this is potentially where um, some of the percutaneous devices may provide some uh, additional or uh, uh, novel ways in which to uh, manage uh, patients. If you look at the predictors of recurrence uh, post uh, tricuspid valve annular repair, uh, none of these are going to surprise you. Uh, greater preoperative TR, a larger annular diameter, leaflet uh, tethering, as I mentioned earlier, these are, this is all the subvalvular apparatus, um, and obviously the presence or persistence of pulmonary hypertension, which obviously is a, is a really significant problem. If the patient received a replacement rather than a repair, and I think uh, that data is still going under evolution as, as, we, as we work through these issues, uh, poor LV dysfunction, presence of pacemaker leads through the valve. And then finally, uh, one could almost say that annual repair may not always be uh, the uh, right operation, that maybe um, replacement in some uh, patients may be uh, advantageous. So clearly, uh, still a lot of work uh, needs to be done looking at this. And then if you look at Zach's work, um, the national trends and outcomes of isolated uh, tricuspid valve therapy, you can see here uh, starting in 2004 up to about 13, that uh, replacement was, uh, was, was continued to grow and that repair uh, was also growing. But you can see that the lines are becoming closer together and people are, are obviously thinking more about repair um, and replacement in different ways as time goes on. So TV replacement was performed in 60% of patients where repair was uh, in 40%. And then that changed a little bit from a place in, uh, significantly decreased from 67% uh, percent to uh, 57%. So that's, that's important. But overall, whether the patients were getting a repair or replacement, and I think this is a, an important uh, aspect, is that the overall mortality was about 9%. And I, I did not mention, but specifically, this is around isolated tricuspid valve uh, therapy. So now we've moved on from thinking about left-hearted procedures where we were going to treat the tricuspid valve. Now we're specifically looking at national trends and outcome 
in isolated tricuspid valve therapy. And at least in my experience, in the number of institutions I've worked at and, um, and I've been involved in a number of uh, patients with this uh, problem, they're often um, very, very ill patients and um, isolated tricuspid valves, the surgery, uh, has not really uh, become a, a significant mainstream procedure. And this is probably due to uh, this uh, high mortality rate. So why is uh, isolated tricuspid surgery um, so, so um, high risk? Um, often they're older patients. Uh, usually they're class four patients. They're very sick. They're cirrhotic patients. They have uh, significant issues like anemia and hypoalbuminemia and also uh, issues with uh, renal function. And you can see here <clears throat> basically some of the graphs showing what, how the impact on each one of these um, determinants overall impacts uh, isolated tricuspid valve surgery. And I, and I think many of us could just think in our own minds is that presenting these to some of our colleagues like Dr. Aldea and others, uh, just how often they, they really are uh, um, thinking about taking these patients to the OR and how high risk these patients are. And I think that is um, one of the big challenges of doing isolated procedures. And it was important in this particular study that really was when talking about the surgery, it really was um, the, um, the, these determinants that were important. It wasn't the procedure um, type which was predictive of mortality. So I think um, basically what we're seeing here is that these patients, when they arrive for isolated tricuspid valve surgery, are incredibly uh, ill. And I think the take-home message of this and I think we would all agree after looking through the list and taking care of many of these patients is we just probably operate uh, too late on these, on these patients. So I think the take home messages for, for, for at this point is that when thinking about isolated tricuspid valve surgery, um, I think that we're going to have to shift a little bit to the left and think about treating these patients uh, a little bit uh, earlier. So when thinking about that, what are some of the percutaneous, um, approaches for uh, tricuspid regurgitation. Well, as many of you know, uh, there was no uh, safe blood vessel from the uh, interventional cardiologist. Uh, we have considered coming from the uh, SVC, uh, from the IVC. This would be a direct uh, atrial approach. Uh, some folks have considered even transapical despite the uh, thinness of the septum. So a number of but different uh, approaches that can be taken. And then the Targets can be the leaflets, we'll speak about that, the annulus, uh, some have used the IVC, and then ultimately uh, valve uh, replacement. So when thinking about innovation, um, this is sort of a fun uh, look about how things sort of go. There's the technology trigger that something needs to be done, uh, inflated expectations, everybody can't, can't believe how cool this stuff is, and we're all really excited. Uh, then we get into the trough of disillusionment, where we're seeing like, oh, goodness, this is really quite complicated. And then some enlightenment always occurs, <clears throat> and then we ultimately uh, plateau. So when in thinking about this innovation curve, uh, what often we, we, we wind up doing is treating um, the sickest patients percutaneously because we don't want to put anybody at additional uh, risk. So if you look at the three surgical databases for isolated TR, and then you compare it to the percutaneous, uh, you can see quite clearly that um, the percutaneous group, as you would expect, um, are patients which are characteristically at higher risk. And ultimately, we could talk a little bit about that in subsequent slides, that it's very hard to really test a technology um, <clears throat> when you're really taking care, of, when you're trying to uh, take care of the uh, sickest patients. Here's a, a just a look at some of the technologies. Um, I'm going to describe some of them. Obviously, not all of them, and um, and some of them unfortunately already have uh, postmortems in terms of uh, where they are in the overall um, toolbox and what we're able to uh, use. <clears throat> One device which we found to be very intriguing was what's called the tri-line device, which you would take uh, two leaflets, you'd bring them together, and you would be calling what's calling bicuspidizing the tricuspid valve. So instead of it being a tri-leaflet valve, you would make it a two-leaflet valve and thus decrease the overall orifice size. Cardioband is a device which creates an annuloplasty ring. 
around the uh, valve and just like a surgeon would do, just tethers it uh, together. And then Fortec or Tricinch, what they did was they put a stent in the <clears throat> inferior vena cava and almost like a grappling hook on the anterior wall of the right ventricle and literally pulled it in in order to reduce the overall tricuspid valve um, um, diameter and cinch down the, the RV somewhat. And when looking at this, this uh, trilon, uh, despite some reasonable clinical data, just really could never make it work. Uh, just uh, a very challenging procedure. So they're no longer uh, a viable um, uh, opportunity. And, um, and Fortec or Tricinch, which we were uh, principal investigators on also, um, I think they suffered more from the COVID um, crisis and, and economics, but uh, they no longer a serviceable company at this point uh, either, unfortunately. Other procedures, which many of you are aware of, some of the work we've done here is uh, edge-to-edge -edge repair on the tricuspid valve. And then um, really maybe one of the more creative ones is the former device, which is basically screwing in a balloon into the, um, <clears throat> into the right ventricle and literally just putting a spacer inside of the, um, inside of the tricuspid valve uh, just to occupy room and reduce overall tricuspid regurgitation. So let's just look at some of these technologies. This is the tri-repair. This is the annuloplasty ring. Um, here is some of the data. I think it's provocative data. Um, and then earlier when we talked about the grading scale, this really dri was driven, uh, in my mind, a little bit by describing, you know, these kinds of results where pre-procedure would have been characterized as torrential, post-procedure would be characterized as severe. And if this was the only method of grading it, it would have gone from severe to severe. And then you'll see that there was some changes in vena contracta area, left uh, ventricular stroke volume area, all moving in the right direction. And also, um, you can see that the patients did somewhat better. Uh, again, early data, small group of patients, but overall at 30 days at least, there appeared to be an overall improvement uh, in these patients. So that, I think that's important to uh, recognize. The device itself um, has challenges. It's an annuloplasty ring. You're literally screwing in anchors. And when you're screwing those anchors in, one has to be very careful because we know that uh, as you go around the tricuspid valve, and this is work by Dimitri Levin, my partner at the Center for Cardiovascular Innovation, uh, we describe to them as these, as you get to the mid RCA, you come closer and closer um, to the right coronary artery. And obviously this is uh, quite an issue and, and causing disruption of the right coronary artery uh, is a problem. And you can see here in this nice video, uh, here you can see the anchors in place and you can see the proximities of these annuloplasty anchors um, to um, the right coronary artery. And right now, um, unfortunately, this uh, technology is unavailable and is undergoing refinement specifically around some of those issues. Spend a few minutes on edge-to-edge uh, -edge repair. Uh, this is using um, the mitra clip. It's called the tri-clip. Uh, the study is called Triluminate. Uh, we'll be in that study, and uh, Jamie McKay will be leading it up with Christine Chung and the structural heart uh, uh, team. Uh, but also, uh, instead of using it on the mitral valve, <clears throat> we'll be using the um, mitra clip or the tri-clip on the, um, on the uh, tricuspid valve. <clears throat> and you can see here that the majority of the clips go in, and I'll explain why, along the anterior septal uh, leaflets. And you can see between baseline and uh, discharge, a fairly good result. Again, early data, early information, but uh, very provocative in the trends, at least going in the uh, right direction. In terms of clinical improvement, you can see here, the clinical improvement once again exceeded what we would have expected by looking at the um, – at the actual TR, but any one to two grade improvement really has somewhat uh, profound effects very often uh, when taking care of these patients. <clears throat> when looking at uh, independent predictors for failure, all may be quite uh, obvious. It's bad tenting. If the leaflets are very far apart, you can't grasp them adequately. But you can see that if you do have a procedure that is successful, uh, you're likely to, um, to, to impact mortality and rehospitalization. And I think that this drives a lot of our interest in this field and uh, a lot of our excitement in taking care of uh, these patients. 
So again, going back to the anatomy, um, I think here what we're what I'm trying to demonstrate very clearly is that when you are doing uh, the clip, we always try to go uh, between the septal leaflet, which is here, and the anterior leaflet, which is here. And the rationale is that the septal leaflet being part of the septum um, creates a force actually pulling in uh, the wall of the RV. And early on, I think we talked a lot about this with our surgeons, with many other folks in the field, and we didn't really think that that's possible, that you could literally, you know, create a tension on, on, on the wall of the heart. But in fact, uh, we, you can, and, and we've even seen it on the left side. So this is what it would look like. This would be a traditional clip going from the septal leaflet to the uh, anterior leaflet. The anterior leaflet almost always very large. Uh, the anterior leaflet actually having papillary muscles. So you are pulling it on the wall significantly. And then the septal leaflet, generally without a papillary muscle, with the actual septal leaflet inserted directly into the septum, which I think creates a lot of that buttress uh, effect when you're actually pulling uh, the wall over. Looking at the former device, uh, just moving on, this is that spacer device that you're putting into the uh, right uh, ventricle. You can see it here. Here's just a nice uh, image of it screwed into the right ventricle. Um, and there's been a U.S. feasibility uh, trial with, um, with really, unfortunately, uh, quite a few complications, two deaths uh, during the procedure. If you were successful, you did get a reduction, you did get an improvement, and that you did get patients feeling a whole bunch better, uh, and the six-minute uh, time improved uh, as well. But the challenges really did exceed the um, overall benefit of this device, and, and this program, similar to the uh, CardioBand program, uh, is presently uh, on hold uh, as well. And then finally, let's just move into the, uh, the replacement uh, group. This is the three uh, uh, devices which will now be available. Um, University of Washington will be uh, involved in this study. Again, this will be um, uh, championed by uh, Jamie McCabe and Christine Chung. This is, uh, it will be called Tricent. I, I'm very excited. The early data looks extremely uh, provocative. Uh, when looking at approaches, um, there are several devices. Some are transjugular, uh, uh, some are uh, trans uh, right atrial, on a number of different ways of uh, accessing um, the uh, tricuspid valve. But predominantly, all of these methods uh, are challenged by just the angles of orientation. Uh, coming in from the IJ, it's it's a fair it's a fairly straight shot, and we know that more or less. Um, because our colleagues who, um, who do swan gans catheters in the OR don't even need to use fluoro. They just seem to go from the, <clears throat> from the SVC right into the, um, right into the tricuspid valve. But putting a very large valve across it is, is a, is a completely uh, different uh, issue. And really understanding all those nuances is important, uh, when doing this. This is, uh, one of the devices, uh, the Navigate, which was initially started with a right, uh, atrial, um, approach. Um, and then basically here you can see a uh, severe TR. Uh, this is a right ventricular gram. You can obviously hear severe TR. And then in this view, you can see the, this approach. This again is, um, transatrial, uh, pulling back the catheter, paying attention not to create any problems to the, uh, right uh, coronary artery, uh, followed always exquisitely by, um, by TEE. And then ultimately, you can see here with, with, with this device in place, a beautiful result with very limited uh, TR, residual TR. Obviously, there's always concern about the RV function after this and whether or not um, there would be any further decrement in RV function. But that's something we're going to have to continue to look at and learn. And this procedure is now moving to a uh, percutaneous uh, method uh, as well. So when looking at um, outcomes uh, after all of these uh, catheter manipulations, you could see still that the mitra clip remains one of the predominant um, devices, uh, former on hold, cardio band on hold, tricin shot is no longer available, uh, triline no longer available, and these cable approaches are really uh, quite uh, limited. So the toolbox, which started fairly robust, is uh, slowly uh, getting uh, smaller and smaller. But what we have learned, which I think is important, is if you do get a good outcome and, um, and you're able to um, address the, the challenges of these procedures, that these patients will do better. And uh, these approaches, uh, once we're able to refine them, 
and become more elegant with them, I think are going to be a positive overall impact on a very, very difficult uh, group of patients. Here is a summary of the data for the functional TR. Um, just um, I, I, I give you this uh, graph just maybe for subsequent review as to what the technologies are, uh, what the type of patients that are being selected, and what the overall uh, outcomes are. So let's, uh, in summary, um, we have uh, some proposed uh, new classifications for how to manage these patients, maybe to get to them a little bit earlier in their process, uh, not waiting, maybe, you know, thinking about stage three when the TR is severe and they've got some of these vague symptoms, they're already on diuretics, and think about per potential percutaneous or surgical methods. And I think this is important um, chart to look at, to look at all of the various, um, you know, sort of nuances of, of the echo, of the therapy they're on, and whether or not one consider either an open procedure with surgery or a percutaneous procedure. And you can see that regardless of what type of TR these patients have, um, they, all, they all do worse overall um, with regard to their overall outcomes. I think it's really important that we really start thinking about these patients uh, more carefully because the prognos her prognosis, this, irrespective of the, um, of the TR, uh, affects these patients uh, long-term quite significantly. <clears throat> Alex uh, Lawton uh, is working on what's called the TRUE, T-R-U-E, uh, sort of calculator in terms of trying to calculate which patients are more likely to have a higher morbidity and mortality. This is a work in progress. They had a developmental phase where they came out with, a, with, a, with these whisper charts and these risk assessments. And they also are now looking more specifically at a developmental uh, program and looking at how to categorize these patients so that they could have direction in terms of treatment. And I think the analogy would be sort of when we think about the Chad Vasque score or the ROPE score. Um, and I think these are extremely helpful uh, when uh, taking care of these uh, patients. So the transcatheter uh, valve is no longer forgotten. I think we've seen a lot of the data that we can um, take care of these patients. I think we do have to get them early in the disease process. We have to be specific about anatomy. We have to get safety. We have to get eff efficacy and overall improved outcomes. And I think a lot of the early work uh, suggests uh, these uh, possibilities. I think looking at this uh, particular uh, schematic really gives a lot of uh, help when thinking about these patients as you're clinically taking care of them, thinking about them when they're early, during the progressive phase, and obviously during the late phase. And I think all three of these are um, critical when, um, when considering these uh, patients. So in summarizing uh, the devices, I think we're somewhere about now where we have uh, severe TR, the symptomatic, they're, they're sick people, and we're really focusing on safety. Hopefully in the next two to five years, a lot of the work that will be done here, we'll be exploring a lot of these technologies. And then over five years, I think, um, we'll basically have an ideal target. We'll be able to be very elegant in picking procedures and deciding what to do. So let's uh, quickly go through our three patients, which we presented earlier. We had that patient with the severe MR and TR. We did the nice clip result. And then he continued to have TR, pacemaker in place. Uh, what did we do for this gentleman? Uh, he had a very large, uh, almost six uh, centimeter um, annulus. And so the, the plan for our friend here, due to the fact that the pacemakers are causing a lot of the problems, is we're going to wait a little bit and we're looking for um, probably a replacement therapy for him. I don't think we have anything right now that's going to be helpful for him uh, due to the fact that his pacemaker is really impinging on that leaflet. And although we've done a few of these, um, uh, he's able to manage with diuretics, um, and unless he forces our hand, uh, we're just going to sit on him a little, a little while. Our patient with uh, simulants and hepatic encephalopathy, um, we put initially one clip in, and then we wound up with three clips. <clears throat> and you can see here really a quite uh, excellent result. Um, I did some, uh, some chart diving, and actually he's, uh, he's uh, doing okay. He's having some electrophysiologic problems with uh, our EP uh, partners are taking care of. But overall, from, from the perspective of the TR, he's really – uh, tremendously uh, improved. And, um, and uh, so that's where we are with this uh, very nice gentleman. 
And then the, the gentleman who was status post mitral valve uh, repair, 120 days in the hospital, referred from outside hospital, had really a very, very uh, significant amount of TR. Uh, you can see here, this is his final result after uh, several uh, clips were placed, uh, much improved. Uh, just to give you a flavor, this is um, the result uh, fluoroscopically. One of our clips actually um, became detached from one of the leaflets during the procedure speaks quite uh, nicely to the uh, frailty of a lot of these leaflets, but he uh, is doing uh, well. His initial vena contracted area uh, when we started this procedure, um, if I could get this going, was 3.46, uh, uh, which is obviously enormous, uh, and his vena contracted area now is, um, is 1.08. And the proof of the pudding is, uh, this is a picture I took with uh, Burkhard Mackinson, who's been my partner and colleague for a large number of these patients. This is our friend who gave us permission to take a, a picture with him. And uh, the only thing he d he's been doing wrong, he was up on a ladder painting his house on the 29th. And we told him that probably wasn't the best idea. But as you can see, uh, he's done tremendously uh, well. So with that, I'll end. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity for uh, being able to present the grand rounds today.